This week, three specific things. We're going to distinguish within sentences between subjects and predicates. Uh, we're also going to learn how to characterize relationships between two or more things using uh, a slightly different notation or an expanded notation. And finally, uh, we won't be getting to this uh, immediately, but finally, uh, predicate logic will allow us to ca characterize important quantification features of sentences. Uh, and that's part of, as I say, part of the facility that was necessary in order to develop, uh, uh, to move towards set theory and logic out of, out of this calculus. Uh, these uh, quantificational features turn out to be quite important. All right. Uh, let me give you another example that will show you why we need to make a uh, a move like this. Here's a sentence logic uh, representation of two propositions. Uh, e, let, let's let E be everyone will attend law school, and let S mean someone won't attend law school. Or you could say S could be someone would, uh, does attend law school, and then negate that for doesn't. But let's just leave it like that. And then look at this implication. If it's not the case that everyone will attend law school, then it is the case that someone won't, right? Now, that's, that just follows logically. But the, the sentence calculus doesn't allow us to see that. I mean, we're, we could write down something like curl E horseshoe S, but we can't see that it's, you know, it's logically necessary. That S logically follows from not E. And so that's, that's you know, just a, a quick indication of what sorts of things are going on behind the scenes in sentence logic that we can't represent. And that's a, a one primary reason for moving forward into predicate calculus. All right. Um, now, the notation is just going to build on what we've got so far. And uh, so we've got atomic sentences. Predicates, like atomic sentences, are going to be represented with uppercase letters. It'll be easy to tell when you've got an atomic sentence and when you've got a predicate. We'll show that in a moment. But uh, we're going to continue using uppercase letters for, at for, for full atomic sentences. And then when we wish to break uh, atomic sentences down into, into subjects and predicates, we will use uppercase let letters for predicates and also for relationship names. Names now, like Agnes and Bob and uh, Betty Lou Johnson, names are going to be lowercase letters. Now, in each case, we're going to exclude V because we're using V for or, for, for, for our uh, logical connective for disjunction. So that's not going to be one of the letters we're allowed to use. And in the case of the lower case letters being used for names, we're only going to use up to V for names. And if you ever had more than uh, that many names that you wanted to represent in a sentence, then you can start putting subscripts on them. Uh, or if you wanted to use uh, these names to represent numbers, you know, you may have more than 23 or whatever that is, numbers that you want to talk about. And so you just start putting subscripts on the lowercase letters, and that'll allow you to give as many names as you may need. We won't need very many in our introduction to this stuff. And the reason uh, we're going to not use the other lowercase letters is because we're going to use the ones after V as, uh, as variable names. So these are uh, the, the, the names for particular things. When we want to represent uh, sentences and, and pick out the subjects of those sentences, the names are going to be used, uh, the lowercase letters, up, up through U. Okay. 
And then the way that we're going to write this is something like that. In this case, where W stands for will attend law school, and A is the name we're giving to Agnes. You might as well keep using some sort of mnemonic devices for this, but you could you choose any letter you like. We write W, capital W, small a. And uh, we'll always be given an interpretation whenever we need it, which reminds us exactly what W means and what A means. But this is the way we write, Agnes will attend law school, instead of just one long, or one, one capital letter W. All right? And then when we have relationships, like in Agnes is older than Bob, we'll have more names than one. So that, for example, OAB is Agnes is older than Bob, in with a sort of an obvious uh, way of choosing what those letters will mean. And then down here, the second one, SBBD, that's a triadic relationship, and a relationship between three things. But in this case, we're, we're going to, I've just chosen to use uh, A is one, B is two, C is three, D is four, and so forth. And so a way of symbolizing the sum of two and two is four is to say S, B, B, D, using that particular symbolization. So with that, you can see you can have as many uh, relata, as many things related as you want in relationship names. And uh, it's pretty obvious how all of these things work. And then in general, If an uppercase letter is immediately followed by no lowercase letters, it continues to be an atomic sentence. Okay, As we call that a zero-place predicate. All right, so we're good. all of these things represent predicates, technically speaking. But when you've got a zero-place predicate, that means you're just using uh, the capital letter to indicate an atomic sentence. And uh, unary relationships: if an uppercase letter is immediately followed by one lowercase letter. That's a one-place predicate, and so forth. Binary relationship is one that's followed by two lowercase letters. And in general, if an uppercase letter is immediately followed by n lowercase letters, then it's an n-place predicate. And that's all, all I got for you. All right, so for now, though, all I, 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 there's not, I don't want to spend an awful lot of time with this. Um, I just want you to, you know, try your hand at a, you know, one brief uh, symbolization exercise. Here are five things. If you would go ahead and uh, and try to use these new techniques using A, B, and C as the names for Agnes, Bob, and Carol. W stands for will attend law school, and O stands for is older than is older than. And I'm gonna offer you another thing that I didn't put up there. I should have probably done this, but um, a universe of discourse, or UD, or sometimes it's called a domain of discourse, uh, needs to be specified so that we just don't have to, you know, like for example, here it's going to be a bunch of, uh, the universe of discourse is a bunch of uh, students. And this will become important when we get to quantification. But uh, basically, uh, we want to sort of you know, not to say uh, we're quantifying over a domain that covers everything in the, in, in the entire uh, possible world of discourse. We want to sort of cut that down so that we don't have to, you know, pick things out in, in great detail. So our, our universe of discourse here uh, is just, a, you know, a bunch of students um, maybe at RIT for all I care. But uh, if you would go ahead and do these five exercises. Okay, Josh, uh, what's number one look like to you? Okay. All right. In this case, it was rather than Agnes, it's Bob. <laughs> I just followed that particular model almost exactly. Uh, Will, Resh, what about number two? <coughs> Where's the big W go? I think in front, right? 
Okay. No, you can't do it like that. As a matter of fact, in particular, I mean, I think you're probably thinking of something that might go like that. That's not the way we're going to do our notation, okay? Because these are, because the, those connectives are not supposed to connect names, they're supposed to connect sentences. So we can't use them in this particular way. Uh, another suggestion, yeah? W, B, and W, C. That's it. So you've got to write it all the way out. I mean, I under, go ahead, Kevin. Did you write W, B, C? That would be uh, some, I mean, what, let, me, let me just write over here. Let's, let's look at W, B, C. That would be a two-place predicate. And we don't have one at work in the sentence. Right? So, oh, notice how the word older than, which is our example in the next thing and, and was our example before, uh, that, that works in a, in a different way than will attend law school. It really does relate to things. And will attend law school doesn't relate, it's, it's a unary predicate. I mean, you can hear it on the, on, on the face of it. So, uh, while it's another possibility, uh, you know, sort of that they might have designed the predicate calculus a little bit differently and different people might do it different ways. That's not the way we're doing it. We're going to make sure that we keep, anytime we have a, a unary predicate, we're going to sort of make sure that we represent that by having a single capital letter and then a single lowercase letter next to it. So this is the way we would do both Bob and Carol will attend law school, number two. Slightly more complicated, number three, uh, Alex Minor. So I can't hear you. Oh. Uh, o A C implies not W B. Yes. Right? Because now we do have a binary predicate in older than. And um, and notice I mean look look back to the example over here of the of the uh, the, tr uh, the triple predicate, the triple rel relation, it really does, th this, this sentence does call for taking two things, putting them together, and getting a third. And so that's the sign, I mean, that tells you how many uh, relata will be in the predic predicate. And so you just sort of ask yourself, what is it asking me to do? Or what does this predicate seem, how does it seem to work? Any questions about number three? It's OAC, horseshoe, curl, WB. Okay, uh, number four, how about uh, Alex Ojda? I have uh, tilde bracket WB. I'm sorry, a little slower, what? Uh, tilde bracket WB or WA. That works fine. What's another way of doing it? Josh? Uh, not WB, yeah, not WA. Yes, that's equivalent. And you know they're equivalent by virtue of De Morgan, also, right? So when you can hear the sense, I mean, I you know how you how one hears a sentence or how one thinks a sentence, you know, may re will reflect exactly how you write this down. That if you got if you got it right, then these things should be logically equivalent to one another. Any questions about number four? And how about five? Um, bread. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. Any questions at all about this particular technique? Because I don't think we need to go through these things chapter and verse. It's pretty straightforward. It, uh, one of the most <coughs> crucial additions in the predicate calculus is quantification, and in particular, we're going to be introducing uh, the existential quantifier and the universal quantifier. That's all you get. You only need those two. Um, and then we're, there's also a, we're going to be using a, a, a kind of a, a notation that I mentioned before. Want to uh, now bring it out explicitly? It's the idea of the universe of discourse. Uh, we're going to be quantifying over. Um, variables, and we have to know what is the range of those variables. Otherwise, you know, we have to make, 
put in all kinds of details about exact, you know, specifying exactly which things we want to talk about. And one way of eliminating this for any particular discussion is to say, look, all we're talking about, say, in, the, in, this, this, in this example, said, Let's, all we're talking about is the positive integers. So if I say there is an x, I'm just saying within the domain of positive integers. Or maybe it's within the domain of students in our class. That's our universe of discourse. Or within the, the domain of furry little animals. I don't know what you know, the domain is, but you know, when you're talking about something, you say, here's our domain of discourse. And we do that in order to eliminate the necessity of being much more precise about all of, of the uh, quantifiers than, than we need to be for our present purposes. So UD is the, is designates the universe of discourse. And I think there will be no exceptions from now on in the Logic Cafe whenever we're talking about these symbolization projects. We will always, you will always see a universe of discourse <coughs> displayed. If you see none displayed, then you're left with saying, well, the universe of discourse is every possible thing in the, um, in, in the universe. You know, from motes of dust to planets to uh, spiral galaxies to little kitty cats. I mean, that, that, would be, <laughs> that would be what you'd be left with if you didn't specify a domain of discourse. All right, so here, for our example, Let's uh, specify that the university, uh, this for the first example, only the, we'll get away from numbers in a second. But uh, let's say that the universe of discourse is the positive integers, and the capital L will be a binary relation. A binary predicate uh, is less than. And so you know that because it's a binary predicate that you should expect to see two names, two names like uh, a and B or B and C, you'll expect to see two names after that. And is less than should be read the first variable uh, is less than the second var variable. The other predicate we're going to use for this first example is E, and that just is the unary relation, is even. Remember, the, the domain of discourse is positive integers, and so some of them are odd, some of them are equal, we'll just use the, that particular predicate. OK, uh, using those symbols then, um, that would mean A is less than B. If I wanted to write 2 is even, and while 1 is not, then I would say I'm using the et cetera just indicates that I'm just going to you know, use the first 26 alpha <laughs> letters of the alphabet for the first 26 numbers. Um, but let's say I want to say uh, that 2 is even while 1 isn't. You write it like that. Clear enough, right? Is, that, is, is there any questions about how we're going to use these particular symbols? All right. Now, this is going to allow us to, to um, to introduce the existential quantifier first, written as a backward E, backwards capital E. And it's, it's not going to stand alone like that. It's always going to be written this way. And here's to, to say there is a number less than 3, say there exists an x such that x is less than c, which is the, our name for the number 3. So this is the, 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 the typical notation for a single formula. If you had more than one thing, so you want to say there exists an x such that x is less than c and uh, x is even, then you'd have to write that slightly differently. You'd write it this way. There exists an x, x being a variable. Remember I told you that the letters above V, the lowercase letters above V we use as variables. The lowercase letters prior to V uh, will be used as names, get, uh, given names, or things that we want to represent in our calculus. So if I want to say uh, x is less than, there exists an x such that x is less than c, and x is even, I'd write it like that. where these parentheses indicate that this particular 
uh, variable is bound within that in that sentence. If I wanted to say there exists uh, uh, an x such that x is less than c, and there exists another something. If I want to say there, there's, a, there's a number less than 3, and there's another number greater than 4, then we split it up. It exists an x so that such that x is less than 3, and I can use x again, because it's, it's, I'm outside of that, uh, that bound. I can also use y. It exists a y such that uh, y is greater than 4. So d is less than 1. Clear? Okay, that's the existential quantifier. The universal quantifier is this one. Uh, upside down A. And if I wanted to write all even numbers are greater than 1, it would be written like that. For all x, if x is even, then x is greater than 1. In other words, 1 is less than x. All right. Okay. I think the best way to proceed is uh, uh, is just to go to some examples, and that's pretty much all you'll be doing this week in the Logic Cafe is uh, working on particular examples. So please go ahead and uh, use that universal discourse. This time, it's students, and uh, among the it could be many more students than three, but. Among these students are A, B, and C, Agnes, Bob, and Carola. This is, again, example taken from the Logic Cafe in all its imaginative glory. Um, and then these are the credits. Uh, will attend law school. Will need a loan. And here's a binary credit, predicate uh, scored as well as on the LSATs. So if you would please uh, try those five problems. Luke, how do I do the first one? There exists an x such that an x. And that's it. That one's simple. Uh, Peter, how about the second one? Slightly more complex. I really have no clue. <laughs> OK. Uh, well, first of all, notice that uh, the someone who attends law school is the same person as the one who needs a loan. So that gives you an indication that the, you're going to say you're going to bind both of those sentences with the same quantifier. Um, Chris Fisher. Said there exists an x such that w of x and not n of x. Okay, but I'm going to bind bind the whole thing with the same parentheses, right? So. Ampersand. Okay, there's somebody who, on the one hand, will attend law school, but on the other hand, won't be alone. Any questions about that one? Okay, Sam, what about number three? Um, the uh, universal quantifier. Uh, Wx ampersand not universal quantifier x. Okay, so in other words, I'm going to keep this one. It's going to be not what uh, universal, universal quantifier. And you can use x or y or something. Use any one. Yeah. Can you also do um, for all x, w, x, and there exists a y such that not n of y? You see how that works. So you want me to write, you want me to say, and what? Uh, there exists a y. I got the left side right first. Mm -hmm. So there exists a y, not exists y, or exists y? Exists a y. Okay. Right. Such that not n of y. I don't think that will work. Because it seems to say on the right, the left is fine. It says there is something such, there is at least one.
person in our universe of discourse who doesn't need a loan. That would be their existence such that end up black. Mm -hmm. Look, not everyone will need a loan. This is why. Oh, no, you're right. This is why I said that. Yeah, that works. Yeah. That works. You had it right. Sorry. And what you'll learn later on is that, as a general rule, the negation of a, a quantifier. is equivalent to and you'll get a rule of replacement like that in due course, but don't worry about that now. Okay, uh, Brad, number four. Uh, <clears throat> there exists an X such that uh, NX and not WX Once again, this is a situation where the uh, the existential quantifier covers, I mean, it's the same individual who needs a loan and doesn't attend law school, so that, that quantifier bind, binds the whole thing. Is that what we had it, Brad? Yeah. Okay. And David, number five. Um, I the once again, if you look at the sentence, look at the sentence, you see we're talking about the same person twice. First of all, it's the same person who scored as well as on the LSATs as Bob, who will also lead me alone. It's the same person. Right? So Okay, so I have uh accidental quantifier. Uh parentheses S and XY. A little louder, please. Um Parentheses S, X, Y, uh, and uh, not uh, N, X, Y. And you said not something? Or, oh no, just and X, Y. And percent, okay. Yeah. And what's that? N, X, Y. N, X, Y? Or is it just X? I don't know. Well, why do we have? This shouldn't be Y, by the way. It should be B, shouldn't it? We know who Y is. Someone scored as well in the LSAT oh, as Bob, so it's SXB, and we only got one variable X, and but that same person, X, will be alone, right? Yeah. Is that correct? Okay, any questions about anything at all? All right, I'll hang around for as long as anybody needs me, and otherwise the class is through for the day.